Our scripture reading this morning is Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 19. That reading may be found in the Pew Bible on page 876. And he said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you now knowing that we need this word, believing that we need this word. We ask that you would make this word that I'm going to preach this morning a meal for us. Would you cause us to live by it? Would you cause us to see your son clearly here in your word and help us, we pray, to obey him? We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Serving people is a messy business. If you don't believe me, walk downstairs to our nursery right now and have a look around. Serving all those little people is not a clean, mess-free business, is it? There are noses to be wiped. There are diapers to be changed. There are Cheerios to dish up and, and cups of water to be filled. Serving people is a lot of messy work. And that's not just true of little people, is it? Serving big people takes a lot of work too. Just think of all it took to get this space ready for us to meet here this morning. Since the last time we were here, floors had to be vacuumed, coffee pots had to be washed and refilled with fresh coffee, bathrooms had to be cleaned and restocked, chairs had to be set up and arranged. Serving people is a lot of work, and it's messy work. And I've just talked about meeting physical needs, keeping kids clean and fed and getting this building ready for use. It's actually even messier when we're talking about helping people spiritually, helping people grow in holiness, forgiving one another when they sin. That's quite challenging. That's quite difficult. That's very messy. Well, in our text this morning, Jesus is giving instruction in exactly that kind of difficult service, helping brothers and sisters grow in holiness and even forgiving them in the messiness of their sin. And as we'll see, Jesus' own disciples think that's a pretty tall order. And maybe you do too. So so what is it that keeps us in the game? What is it that keeps us serving one another gratefully and regularly even when things are difficult? What energizes you to keep caring for and forgiving your brothers and sisters even in the midst of mess? Do you know how Jesus wants you to fuel your ordinary 
service to your brothers and sisters. Well, let's find out together from the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 17. If you've been with us in this series in the Gospel of Luke, you know that we've been walking with Jesus on the road to Jerusalem. Along the way, opposition to Him from the Jewish leaders has been increasing. At the end of chapter 16, Jesus has just finished exposing the Pharisees for disregarding the Old Testament Scriptures that they claim to love. He told this story, right, of the rich man and of Lazarus. And this rich man, his values are pointedly similar to their own. The rich man didn't love his neighbor, and so he experienced the eternal discomfort of hell. And Jesus is telling the Pharisees, you're headed to that exact same fate. But our text today picks up with Jesus now turning away from the Pharisees. He's turning to His disciples, verse 1 says, His followers. But don't think the Pharisees aren't still on His mind and likely still within earshot as He teaches. Even as He is addressing His disciples, Jesus is still pivoting off of the bad behavior of the Pharisees. So He turns to His disciples and He gives them instruction on how to care for one another. That is, in contrast to the rich man, in contrast to this rich man I just told you about who, who didn't love his poor neighbor, Lazarus, Jesus wants his followers to love one another, to be on the lookout for one another. Specifically, he wants them to avoid leading one another into sin. Look again at the second half of verse 1. Jesus says, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. So Jesus acknowledges that temptations to sin, or more simply translated, stumbling blocks, they will exist in this fallen, sinful world. There's no avoiding temptations to fall away from faith in Jesus. But Jesus pronounces a woe. He pronounces judgment on those who become the instrument of that temptation. And He adds gravity to that woe by saying, it'd be better for someone to be drowned in the sea than to cause one of his followers to stumble in this way. That's what he says. A, a millstone, he, he talks about a millstone, that's just the large stone rolled in the mill to crush grain. And they were often so large and so heavy, you'd have an animal pulling it, a donkey or a mule. So to have that stone hung around your neck and be cast into the sea means you would be pulled down irrevocably to the bottom without hope of escape. That's kind of a terrifying image, isn't it? I mean, you can hardly, when I think about that, it almost makes me claustrophobic, you know, sinking down and there's no way back up. And Jesus says that scenario of certain death is actually better than one in which someone knowingly leads my followers to shipwreck their faith. Now, when he says one of these little ones, that's who he means. He's talking about his disciples, his followers. Jesus isn't talking about children. He's using language that highlights the frailty and the weakness, relatively speaking, of His followers. It's like back in chapter 12, if you remember, He said, "'Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom.'" He, he calls them a little flock because they're in danger of being needlessly anxious. And here He calls them little ones because they're in danger of being led away. Now, how is it better to die a watery death than to cause one of Jesus' followers to sin? The answer is that those who persist in leading astray Jesus' beloved disciples will find themselves liable to everlasting judgment, everlasting woe, everlasting fire. Much better to face a watery death than a fiery eternity, but that's exactly what you will face if you make it your business to cause your brothers and sisters to stumble. So Jesus says, pay attention to yourselves. Look out. Don't be this person. Keep watch over your brother and sister, and don't put anything in their way that will cause them to fall away from me. His teaching here recalls the prayer that, that He taught His disciples to pray. We just said it. We pray, lead us not into temptation. And now Jesus is saying, be part of the answer to that prayer. Don't lead your brothers and sisters into temptation. Now, when you hear Jesus talking this way about causing little ones to stumble, I think you're meant to immediately think of the Jewish religious leaders, the Pharisees. After all, they were the ones, according to Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, who load people with burdens hard to bear, 
who do not touch the burdens with one of their fingers. And again, he condemns them as the ones who have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. Their self-serving teaching of the law kept people burdened beneath the weight of their traditions. And at the same time, they were pointing people away from the one who fulfills the law and releases them from sins, Jesus himself. That's causing the little ones to stumble. But, but Jesus here, he's, he's addressing his own disciples, and he says, don't be like the Pharisees. They are headed straight to the fires of hell, and you will too if you act like them. Don't take one of these precious sheep that was lost, that I found and brought back. Don't lead them away. He's calling for a, a communal care that presses his disciples then and now to live not as lone rangers, but as your brother's keeper, to live with an eye on the spiritual health and well-being of fellow disciples. And that leads Jesus to command his disciples to serve each other in another way, by forgiving sin. Look at the second half of verse 3 and then verse 4. He says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. So here the scenario that Jesus envisions is is one in which a disciple sins against another. And the protocol that Jesus outlines is straightforward. A brother sins, you confront him, he repents, then you forgive him. And you do that as much as it needs to be done. Jesus says seven times in a day, Not because seven is a magical number, and once you reach eight, the forgiveness shop is closed. That's that's not how it works. You don't have a little tally card. No, the number seven is symbolic. It's the full set, okay? It's the complete amount. The idea is you're offering forgiveness as long as there's a need to offer forgiveness. That's what Jesus is saying. And Jesus is showing His disciples to do, he's asking them to do what he himself is doing in the Gospel of Luke, isn't he? This is what we see him doing. He confronts sin. He goes to sinners. He goes to those who are sick. He confronts them, and they repent, and Jesus forgives them. And he says, you exercise that same dynamic in your life together as disciples. It's what we see the father do in the parable parable of the prodigal son. When he sees his son a far way off, he runs to him to restore him and to forgive him. And Jesus is saying, that's how I want you to be with one another, eager to forgive, eager to receive back seven times a day or more if need be. Don't be like a Pharisee. Don't be like an older brother who stands on the side and says, We're going to receive this son back after everything he's done. No, you keep forgiving and keep forgiving and keep forgiving. Now, there's a lot about this process of forgiveness that's not outlined here that you might be wondering about. Like, for instance, Jesus assumes that the fellow disciple whom you confront always repents, which, of course, is the best-case scenario, isn't it? But it's not the only one that could happen. Jesus doesn't outline the manner of the rebuke. Should it be gentle? Should it be stern? Should it be in person or over the phone? He doesn't give any detail on on what role the broader church should play or how this relates to the process of of church discipline. He's not providing an exhaustive explanation of everything involved in forgiveness and the reconciliation process. He's giving a thumbnail sketch that contains all the necessary parts. What do you do when a brother sins against you? you rebuke him. He repents, you forgive him. And the part that Jesus especially wants to emphasize is the super abounding forgiveness. What marks his disciples uniquely is their durable forgiveness, their seeming unlimited ability to let go of the sins of others. Of course, Jesus has already taught his disciples again in praying to pray, forgive us our debts, what? As we forgive our debtors. He taught His disciples to appeal to God for a forgiveness for themselves that's as sure as their forgiveness of their brothers. And here He's just fleshing out those dynamics. Christians are the forgiveness people. We're in the forgiveness business. But the disciples hear this teaching on forgiveness, and it feels like to them a very tall order. Look again at verses 5 and 6. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. 
And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Jesus, in a ring of disciples, the apostles, they say in essence, if you want us to do all that, if you want us to be our brother's keeper and you want us to be forgiving each other all the time, well, you better give us a lot of faith. You better give us a special dose. You better give us an extra blessing so that we can do what you're asking here. But Jesus says, no, no, you don't need great faith. You just need faith. He says, if, if you had faith that was tiny as a little mustard seed, you'd have power to do something as extraordinary as uproot that mulberry tree over there and throw it into the sea. Now, now don't be confused. There's no significance to the mulberry tree it, itself. It was just a big tree with deep roots, and there was probably one standing nearby. Jesus is not saying His disciples will go around uprooting trees by faith. He's saying there's sufficient power for those who believe in Him to serve and forgive their brothers. You don't need big faith. You need a big Savior, and you have one. Grab hold of me, He says. Trust me, believe me, and find the power to forgive and to serve. So serving fellow disciples by watching over them and forgiving them, that's not some extraordinary work that can only be carried out by giants of the faith. No, it's basic Christianity. It's for all disciples who have faith in Jesus. And Jesus seeks to, to further illustrate that ordinary nature of what He's asking with a brief parable of a servant and a master. Look at verses 7 to 10. Jesus says, "'Will any one of you who has a servant plowing, or keeping sheep, say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table. Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that, was command, that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty." So Jesus asks this question. He asks whether you would expect a servant to serve himself before having finished serving his master. And the assumed answer is, of course, no. And then he asks whether his disciples would expect a master to thank his servant for doing his duty. Again, the assumed answer is, is no. He doesn't thank him for doing his job. Now, you may not like that. It might feel impolite or harsh to you, like, well, sure, it's his duty, but would it have killed the master to show a little kindness and say thank you? But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. This isn't a manual for managing your Chick-fil-A or your small business. <laughs> He's asking a very narrow question. He's asking this, when a servant has done what a master requires, has he done anything extraordinary? Is the master in any way indebted to the servant? Has he earned anything. No, he hasn't. He's only done what was required. So, Jesus says, when you have done all that you were commanded, and what is it they're being commanded to do? They're being commanded to take care of and forgive one another. Jesus says, when you've done all that, what is your response to be? They are to say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. In other words, when you hear Jesus saying, pay attention to one another and forgive one another, you're not to think like the apostles, yikes, that must require some crazy level of faith. No, it requires ordinary faith, faith in Jesus. Nor are you to think, wow, if I serve my brothers and sisters like that, if I forgive them, I must really be something. I must really be great. God must be indebted to me. No, no. You are a humble servant. You have only done what is your duty. That ends Jesus' discourse with His disciples about service and faith. But as they get back on the road to Jerusalem, a scene unfolds that provides a rather unexpected example of the kind of faith Jesus wants His disciples to have. Look down again at verses 11 to 19. Let's read that again. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. 
When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. So Jesus is back on the road to Jerusalem. He's on the road to the cross. He's passing between Samaria and Galilee, and he enters a village, and he encounters a group of lepers. Now, let's just talk about leprosy for a minute. What is it? What's the significance of it? So leprosy is a catch-all term that referred to a number of skin diseases in the ancient world, none of them pleasant. The symptoms of the diseases known as leprosy included things like numbness, sores, discoloration of skin, deformities, and even the possibility of the loss of appendages. They were nasty, unpleasant diseases, and they were considered to be highly contagious. But leprosy was far more than just a medical condition in ancient Israel. Under the Old Testament law, those who were leprous, those who had leprosy, were ceremonially unclean. They were not permitted in the tabernacle or the temple. They couldn't even live inside the camp, inside the city. You had to dwell, you had to live apart from God's people. You were required to keep your distance, which is exactly what we see these guys doing. It says 10 lepers stood at a distance. They're just doing what they're required to do under the law. Now, in the way God prescribed Israel's life in the Old Testament, God dwelled in His people's midst, right? He dwelled with them in the camp, at its center, in the tabernacle. But the leper had to live outside the camp, far off, away from people, and also away from God. So again, leprosy is more than just a medical problem. It's more than just a social problem. It pictured being radically unclean, away from God's presence. And there were no prescriptions for healing this disease. There were prescriptions in the law for cleansing a person once they had been healed, once they had gotten better. But apart from an act of God, there was no way to remove leprosy from a leper. But the lepers know that Jesus is one who does acts of God. So they stand at a distance as required by the law and they call out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They believe He can heal them. They've heard the stories. Maybe even the story recorded for us in Luke chapter 5 where Jesus cleanses a leper by touching him. Jesus, it says, sees them. And He instructs them. He says, go, show, yourselves, show yourself to the priest. Why does he say that? Well, the law required a priest to verify that a leper had been cleansed. That's in Leviticus 13 and 14. So when Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest, he's saying, you're as good as cleansed. By the time you get there, you'll be all set. And sure enough, as they go on their way, wonder of wonders, they are cleansed. They are healed. Now, just stop there for a moment and consider, Jesus has done what no priest could do. Jesus has done what the law could not do. He's done, in fact, what only the Lord can do. It is God, the Lord, it says in Psalm 103, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. These poor men cried out to the Lord for mercy, and He answered them and delivered them out of all of their fears, because He is the Lord. Now, one of these lepers, noticing that he's been healed, he turns back. And in the same way that he called out to Jesus with a loud voice, now he praises God with a loud voice. He returns, and notice he's no longer concerned to stand at a distance. He's been cleansed. He goes right up to Jesus and falls at his feet in praise and in thanksgiving. And this is entirely appropriate. Jesus, as God, is the one qualified to heal this leper, and Jesus, as God, is fully qualified to receive their grateful thanksgiving and praise. And now we're given one subtle piece of information about this returning leper. He's a Samaritan. Remember the Samaritans? We've run into them in this book before. They're the group of half-Jews 
living in the region of Samaria, and they're despised by the Jewish nation. They're the ones who have a, a truncated Old Testament, and they worship at the wrong temple. They're the last ones you would think would know the score. But here he is. He's one of Jesus' little ones. He's bowing at his feet. He knows God has cleansed him, so the right thing to do is thank Jesus. And Jesus immediately recognizes the uniqueness of this Samaritan. He says, we're not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? He wonders aloud about the other ten. Did none of the other lepers, none of the other Israelites, the ones who are my people, the ones who have the law and the prophets, did none of them return to me? There's more going on here than just one Samaritan guy remembering to thank Jesus for his healing and the rest of the Jewish guys forgetting. It's more than that. It's part of a larger pattern we've, pattern we've seen throughout Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of Luke. The strongest rejection, the fiercest opposition came from his own people, the Jewish nation. He's coming to his own, and his own are not receiving him. It's almost like in healing them, he's thrown a party. But only this foreigner, this Samaritan, has answered the invitation. So what does Jesus say to him? This one leper, this lone leper who gets it, he says, rise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Or another way to translate that, your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. What is Jesus saying? He tells the Samaritan that he's been more than cleansed from disease. All the lepers have been cleansed. But Jesus is saying, your return to me, your adoration of me, it shows that you've done more than just receive me as a healer. You've believed in me as Savior. And you've been cleansed not just from your leprosy, but from everything it symbolized, from your sin. And so he's been brought near not just back into society, but he's been brought back near to God himself, to Jesus, God the Son incarnate, the one before whose feet he has fallen. And so Jesus says, go, you are well, you are saved because you have grasped me by faith. Now, how is it that Jesus can guarantee such a salvation to this man? How can he guarantee not only healing from leprosy, which the man could see with his eyes, but also cleansing from sin. It's because at that very moment, Jesus is on the road to accomplish a cleansing from sin. He is on the way to Jerusalem, and there He will suffer on a cross, and His suffering will come by the schemes of the Jewish leaders, yes, and it will come under the supervision of Roman rulers, yes, but ultimately He will suffer there under the wrath of God Almighty, He'll be pierced for the transgressions of His people and crushed for their iniquities. On Him will be the punishment that brings them peace. And with His wounds, they will be healed. Healed, not from leprosy, but from sin. Through His death, His burial, and finally His resurrection, this cleansing Savior will accomplish salvation and free all His people from their sin. And now here's the connection between this healing story and the teaching that came before it. It is that same faith, the faith of the Samaritan, that embraces Jesus as a cleansing Savior that frees and empowers Christians to forgive one another. It is the faith that falls on its face in humility and gratefulness and praise at the feet of Jesus that gets up and gets to work for your brothers and sisters. The disciples said, Lord, if you want us serving one another in the sinful messes you've just described, you better give us some very large measure of faith. And Jesus says, you don't need crazy faith. You just need faith like this Samaritan. Receive me. Receive me as the one who hears the cries of those who are defiled and unclean from their sins. Receive me as the one who sees those who are far off, away from God, away from my promises. Receive me as the one who by the power of my word can promise the removal of transgressions and the one who can remove those transgressions through my cross. Receive me. And if you receive me in that way, you'll have sufficient faith 
to serve your brothers. Embrace me as a cleansing, forgiving Savior, and you will be a serving, forgiving brother. Now, I'm compelled at this point to say anyone here who hasn't embraced this Jesus, you've not trusted in Him, that you have not been cleansed from your sins. You still presently have a disease worse than leprosy, and it doesn't just separate you from God in some ceremonial way, some sort of symbolic way. You have sinned against God Almighty, the one who made everything, who defines all reality. You've chosen to live daily for yourself, to make much of yourself, rather to honor and give thanks to Him. And that sin has defiled you. It has made you unclean before a holy God. And you're on a path right now to live eternally away from the presence of God, not outside the city, but outside heaven, outside of God's presence in a place of fire called hell. But Jesus is near to you today. He's near. You've already seen that He delights to cleanse. He delights to save those who cry out to Him for mercy. So do that. Call out to Him by faith. Call on Jesus. Ask Him to be merciful to you. And if you call on Him in faith, He will cleanse you. This could be for you a day of great praise and thanksgiving because you will be cleansed. Embrace this Jesus today. Now, what about the rest of us here this morning? What do we, what do we take away? What do we do with Jesus' teaching and His healing here? Well, we're driven back to where we started, to the commands He gave at the beginning, wanting to obey Him with Samaritan-like faith. So the first way this text addresses us, I've suggested in your bulletin, is, is in calling us to be our brother's keeper. I'm getting that from the first three verses of, of Luke 17 in which Jesus gives this strong admonition to His disciples to avoid putting stumbling blocks or creating temptations for brothers and sisters. So the first thing I want to ask you in this regard is whether it's even on your radar to be your brother's keeper. As you make day-to-day -day decisions, is the spiritual well-being of your brothers and sisters here on your radar? Are you concerned not only for your own holiness, which you ought to be, but for the holiness of others in the family here? I hope by God's grace that you are. And here are some ways that that gets worked out. So it works itself out in keeping your brother and sister from stumbling, from falling in areas where your consciences differ. So I'm talking about areas of Christian freedom where the Bible doesn't give clear moral commands, but where your fellow disciple, for any number of reasons, might have a moral conviction. This relates to tons of areas like entertainment choices and the consumption of alcohol, what clothing you wear, what schools you decide to put your kids in. Working to keep your brother or sister from stumbling will mean not pushing them to engage in something that, as far as their conscience is concerned, is sin. You don't push a brother to run roughshod over his conscience. So, for example, one big arena for a variety of convictions would be in our entertainment choices. The Bible doesn't give us a point-by-point -point guide for what we can and can't watch, what we can and can't read. There's no list of approved movies or TV shows or which video games are okay or whether video games are even okay. So if you find out that a brother or sister has a moral scruple, let's say, about to watch a certain kind of movie, you fail to be their keeper by pestering them or by cajoling them, calling their conviction silly, like, come on, dude, it's not really that big a deal. It's just a movie. Well, that's totally unhelpful because you're trying to push them to do what for them is sin. Don't do that. Temptations are sure to come in this world, but don't you be the one greasing the skids for temptation for your brother. 
by the way, the person who's choosing not to watch the movie also has the obligation not to judge the other way and say, yeah, I'm not going to see that movie because I'm not a pagan like you. <laughs> the weaker brother can't judge the stronger brother, but the emphasis here is that the stronger brother bears the obligation not to flaunt his freedom over his weaker brother and in so doing create a stumbling block for him. You're trying to avoid anything that pushes your brother or sister to override their God-given conscience. They don't need someone who's supposed to be in the trenches with them, making it harder to see the enemy clearly. No, take the holiness of your brothers and sisters seriously. Their mess is your mess. So being your brother's keeper means seeking to preserve your brother's conscience. Here's another way to be your brother's keeper. Put to death those sins in your life that easily pull others into their orbit. You want to kill those sins that easily gather co-conspirators. Many of the sins of the tongue I'm thinking of, of our speech, are this way. I'm thinking of sins like gossiping. When you gossip about brothers and sisters in this body, you're not only sinning, against them, but now you've, brought, you've drawn that brother that you're talking to into a scenario where he'll be very tempted to gossip as well. Do you see that? You've not only tripped yourself up, but you've tripped up your brother as well. The same thing could be said about grumbling. You know, I, I find I don't generally just grumble to myself. Well, that, that's not totally true. I do grumble to myself, grumble, 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 but then it, find, it goes public, Right? Grumbling finds an object. It finds somebody, especially if you're really worked up with a sense of justice. Something really needs to be done here. You're going to find someone to grumble to. You're going to find someone to grumble to. And like gossip, grumbling has a way of begetting grumbling, doesn't it? But now what have I done? I've taken my grumpy, my impatient, my sinful heart, and I've poured it out on one of my brother's one of Jesus' followers, one of his little ones, and I've led them right to a place where it would be very easy for them now to say, you know what, you're right, grumble, 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 grumble. Jesus says, pay attention to yourselves. Don't do that. Remember how I cleansed you from your sin? Remember how I washed you and made you clean? How I freed you from the leprosy of your sin? I've done that for your brothers too, so don't lead them back into sin. Be your brother's keeper. So that's the first thing. Second, this text exhorts us to exercise durable forgiveness. Jesus says that if your brother sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. What it means to be part of Jesus' family is that you're part of a group that's been radically freed from sin, cleansed from sin, and yet it's also a group who nevertheless deals with remaining sin. And that means that we will sin against one another in this body. There will be unkind words. There will be dishonesty. There will be anger. There will be coveting. And even as I say that, some of you have a specific person and a situation in mind right now. A brother or sister in Christ that's offended you, that's wounded you. Maybe you've even followed this protocol. You followed up with them. They've repented, they've apologized, but deep down you know you haven't really released on that sin. Your fist is still closed. You haven't handed that debt off to Jesus because that's what forgiveness is. It's, it's choosing to release on a debt owed by another rather than to, than to exact it. And right now you recognize, maybe some of you, that there's a sin of a brother or sister that's still in your grip and I'm calling on you to release it, to forgive, to pass it off. You, you are free in Christ Jesus to do that. You don't have to hold against your brother something that your Savior has paid for. Look to your cleansing Savior and be a forgiving brother. Now, I said some of you immediately have a person or situation that comes to mind when we talk about forgether, forgiveness, but others of you might say, yeah, not really. I think I'm all set. No one really comes to mind. I don't see any relational hurts on the horizon. I think I'm good. That's kind of how this text first hit me. Okay, good. I've got it. a good reminder. Forgive when, when I need to. But before you just skate past this call from Jesus, maybe think about it a bit more deeply. Really try to assess whether there might be some deep 
whirlpools of bitterness and lack of forgiveness that aren't right on the surface, but they're down there below causing turmoil. And here's a question to get at that deeper lack of forgiveness that was helpful to me. Are there, are there painful interactions with a brother or sister that I find myself playing back in my head over and over? Are there scenarios, maybe from a conversation in, in this room or in someone's living room from community group or down at the gym when you were picking up your kids, a scenario that comes back to you again and again, and every time you think about it, it gets you a little bit twisted up with anger or anxiety, that's something you want to take a closer look at. And I know for me, one of the most likely reasons why I'm all twisted up about this past interaction is because of some failure of the protocol Jesus outlines here, very likely a lack of forgiveness. I'm still churning. I'm still replaying the offense. I'm still holding on to their sins rather than releasing them to my Savior who cleanses me with the same grace with which He cleanses them. So what should you do? Well, you need to work Luke 17, 3. Talk to your brother if you need to. Forgive your sister. Release that debt to Jesus. It's not simple. It's not easy but it is what our Lord prescribes. As I said earlier, Christians are the forgiveness people. That, that's our business. The Savior to which we cling is a forgiving Savior. It's our DNA. We say here every week, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We have no excuse to be like the Pharisees standing on the side with our arms crossed, unwilling to welcome back the ones who've sinned. And you can't behind the, hide behind the excuse that this text says, if he repents, forgive him. In other words, I'm happy to do some forgiving if I see some repenting. But that's not what Jesus is teaching. As I've said before, he's giving a thumbnail sketch of the protocol when offenses occur. It's not an exhaustive treatment. And we know from the rest of the Bible that forgiveness is not conditional. Forgiveness is not based on the repentance of others. What lies beneath the forgiveness of our brothers and sisters is the forgiveness of Jesus. He has already paid for our sins and theirs in full. He has washed them. He has made them clean. He has removed their leprosy from them. So you dare not hold against a brother what God does not hold against them in Christ. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. How? As God in Christ forgave you. No, don't let the response of others become an excuse for lack of forgiveness. Forgive. And I've said durable forgiveness because Jesus says you need to be ready to forgive your brother seven times a day. And that makes sense because we live a lot of life together. We do, especially here at this church. That's a wonderful, happy thing. We've got services and ministries and events and community groups and rehearsals and prayer meetings. I mean, we see each other sometimes four, five, six, seven nights a week. But that means there's also lots of opportunities for us to be rude to one another, <laughs> to say something careless to one another, to just rub each other the wrong way. There's going to be repeat offenses and repeat offenders. You're going to be a repeat offender. And it's going to become easy to grow weary in the well-doing of continuing to forgive. You just want to withdraw or bury the offense down deep where you don't have to think about it. And Jesus' word to you this morning is persevere. Persevere in forgiving. Don't withdraw. Don't pull back. Don't let this community of disciples become a place of hypocrisy, a place where we just love appearances, but we've abandoned dealing with another, one another genuinely. No. Commit yourself, brothers and sisters, even when it's painful and tiring, to exercise durable forgiveness. And lastly, underneath all this serving, being your brother's keeper, exercising durable forgiveness, let all that service be fueled with grateful faith. I've said this already in various ways, but, but it needs to be repeated. It's our Samaritan-like faith in Jesus that empowers all of this. It's a grateful, humble, face-on-the-ground kind of faith in Jesus that undergirds all this service to one another. The Samaritan leper was in a desperate situation, and he put his trust in Jesus as the Savior who could cleanse him. And when he embraced that Savior and found salvation, it produced 
all this joy and praise to God. Likewise, when you set your heart afresh on Jesus as the one who has saved you, who has cleansed you, who has freed you from your sin, you are in a posture of gratefulness from which you can joyfully serve your brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus has washed you and cleansed you. Keep your eyes on Him and you can wash the feet of your fellow disciples. The stronger your grip on this Savior by faith, the deeper your gratitude for His cleansing work, the stronger your resolve to keep serving the saints. So when you feel your strength to serve waning, the answer is to get a fresh view of this one who loved you and gave himself for you. See again how he took on himself the debts of your sins so that you might be freed. Remind yourself how it was that he, the one whose honor and glory is from everlasting, was shamed and exposed and ridiculed so that you might share in his endless glory. And even more pointedly, when you are wearied by the offenses of your brothers and sisters and you are inclined not to forgive again, remind yourself how God has been sinned against you in the very same ways, but more grievously and more frequently. There is no dishonor your brother has done to you, Christian, that you have not done in greater measure to God. And yet... And yet, praise God, He did not leave you to wallow in your disease. He sent Jesus. He heard your cry for mercy. He saw you. And when you were a far way off, He cleansed you. Oh, praise God for this Savior. And then looking to Him by faith, extend that same forgiveness and mercy to one another. That's what keeps us caring for one another even in the messes. That's what empowers our ordinary service. We have grateful faith in the cleansing Savior. Would you pray with me? Father, we ask that you take this word now and plant it deep within us so that it bears fruit, so that it bears the fruit of forgiveness, so that it bears the fruit of wanting to care for one another and serve one another. Don't let us be distracted by the cares of this world, by other things, but cause this word to bear fruit, we ask. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.